Well, hello Bryn Derry and welcome to Dennis the Coach and iLearn.cc. You now know that this is a Raspberry Pi and that this is a Raspberry Pi. Which one can you eat and which one costs about £25? Although the Pi is small, it is a capable computer. No, the other one. It is a capable computer. It has these black chips soldered to a green motherboard. If you can control the Pi, then you can control most of the largest machines in the world. This is not a child's toy, it's a useful tool, and you can learn how to use it and realise how powerful it really is, particularly when it's connected to the internet. In these videos, we will use this arrow to indicate the main points on the screen. Important keywords will appear as they are mentioned. And this symbol appears when we are referring to really important stuff. Anything we want you to insert your details into will appear like this. So for me, first name dot last name becomes Richard dot Wenner. Replace or substitute your details as shown. You can always pause, freeze and replay any part of the video that's not understood first time. If you have a problem, then please let us know inside iLearn and we will try to have it sorted for you. Most importantly, keep in touch with your friends and help them out in the forums and discussion areas. This is all here to help you. Just remember. We learned how to connect a Pi. All of the connections are specially designed only to fit one way round, which turns the Pi into a kind of high-tech shape sorter. You have to fit the right plug into the right socket the right way round. To save time, we put a memory card into your machine. At home or school, you may have to do this for yourself. The memory card is like a small SIM card that fits into the bottom of the Pi. The card also only goes one way round. The gold pins go in first and face up to the motherboard. To remove this card, push the edge and it pops back out at you. Don't try to pull it out directly, that just breaks it. On the day, all we needed was to insert the keyboard and mouse into the USB ports. Although, after the first group, we used this little block to connect the mouse and keyboard by radio to remove some of the wires. The network was connected to this large port using an RJ45 connector and pressed it in until it clicked into place. It's called an Ethernet port. The Ethernet port connects the Pi to the network in the school and then onwards to the internet. We did not use earpieces or headphones, but this is where they would have connected. It's the same connection as you get on an MP3 player. The next connector was this large flat connector, which you could remember goes to a large flat screen, an HDMI monitor or display. The last connector was the juice, the electricity supply, and we used a simple mobile phone charger to power the Pi. It is best if this power supply is the last connection you make. Get everything else ready first. If anything doesn't work, then remove the juice and plug it back in and watch the screen as the Pi comes alive and goes through its boot process. So, in this section we learned, connecting the Pi means Inserting your memory card, adding a mouse to any USB port, adding a keyboard to any USB port. Connect the network connector to the Ethernet port. Connect the earphones to the headphones or speaker socket. Connect the flat screen to the long flat HDMI connector. And finally, plug your charger into the small power supply connector. And we're away. With everything connected, the red and green LED lights begin to flash as the Pi booted. We were in. But were we? First, we had to enter a username and a password. The default username was Pi, all in lowercase. We always have to tap the Enter key to tell the Pi we have finished typing and command it to do something in response. It will just sit there waiting otherwise. And then the password. Now the password was not shown on the screen as we typed. This stops anyone from looking over your shoulder and seeing it as we enter it. That's security. You always have to be aware of people observing you as you enter your details. Don't believe what you see on television. They often get it wrong. They don't understand the difference between hackers and crackers. 
There are hackers, good folk, who hack around to see how objects function, improve stuff, and get things to work for people. And crackers, they want to break things, steal and corrupt, crack things open. They're evil. The skills you learn here might be used for hacking or cracking. You decide what you want to be, a hacker or a cracker. The password for the pie was raspberry. That's raspberry correctly spelt with a P in it. All in lowercase and press enter again. All new Raspberry Pis allow the user Pi in with the password Raspberry. These are the default values and something you should change on your own machine as soon as you get it. Security again. Now we really were in and saw a screen with a green prompt that told us we were user Pi on a Pi called Table 1, Table 2, Table 3, depending on where you were sitting on Dennis. In the next section, we will look at some of the things we did. In this section, we learnt that once the power was applied, the Pi went through a boot process. At the end of the boot process, we ended up with a login screen. Enter has to be pressed to tell the Pi to go to the next stage. The password is not printed on the screen. That's a security measure. Once we logged in, we saw a prompt with a flashing cursor. The prompt means the Pi is waiting for your command. The prompt is made up of your login name and the name of the machine you are on. What is the Pi doing as it sits there on your table? To find out, we typed top. We saw this screen, and it was a screen that kept changing, updating as the Pi worked. There were two sections, one here above the white bar and a second section below the white bar. The top section gave us details about the Pi and the bottom was a list of the top tasks running on the Pi. It's all gobbledygook and we don't really need to understand any of this at the moment, but we can get a clue about what is going on if we look a little more closely. Working along the first line we see top, the name of the app we are using, followed by the current time. This time here is how long the Pi has been switched on for, how long it's been up. Here you can see how many users are connected. This is one, and should be just you. If it's more than one, then you should ask who else is logged into your machine. The load is how much work the Pi is doing. This doesn't matter, so we'll move on from here. The next line are the number of tasks carried out on your Pi. On the coach, most of you had 58 or 59 tasks listed. That means the Pi on your table was doing 58 or 59 things. Perhaps only one was actually running, which is the top program you are using to see this list, and 58 were sleeping. These sleeping tasks were waiting for something to happen. None have actually been stopped, and here, none are zombies. Zombie processes are uncontrolled processes that move around inside your Pi. Not a good thing. They need to be destroyed, but more about zombies later. We didn't have time to look at the next three lines that tell us about the CPU, the central processing unit, the brain and what it's doing. And the rest of these details are all about the state of the memory. None of this matters at the moment. Below the white line is a list of the top tasks the Pi is carrying out. This is a quick snapshot of all the tasks the Pi is performing. It's slowed down to allow you to see exactly what is going on. The Pi is actually running much faster than this in reality. Each line is a separate task or process as it's known. You can see the lines bouncing up and down as they are completed. You can see the top process here also bouncing up and down. The name of the command is over in this column, and the total amount of time the Pi has been working on it is shown here. The amount of memory it takes is here, and how much processing power is here. These other columns do not matter at present. You're logged in as user Pi, which is shown here in the user list. Now, every task or process also has an identity, which is given a number, the process identity number, shortened to PID, shown here. So, top is a list of processes running on your Pi. Top allows us to see the time, how long the Pi has been switched on for, 
and how many users are sharing the machine. It lists the tasks, how many are running, sleeping, those that have been stopped, and zombies. Top shows us all of the tasks or processes on a slowed down list. Each process has a number, a name, a total time it's been running, how much memory it uses, and how much processing power it uses. That is top. Just press Q to quit top, and the prompt returns, waiting for your next command. What does your home have that every other home has, but every one is different? It's your address. Imagine the chaos if everyone had the same address. So it is with the internet. Every device connected to the internet has to have a different address. Otherwise, how does all of the data know where to go? But what is an internet address? And how do you see if your Pi has one? The command to see your Pi's internet address is interface configuration that was shortened to one command, ifconfig. Enter ifconfig. More gobbledygook. We will have to get used to seeing large amounts of gobbledygook for a while, but it'll all start to become clear after we've been using it for a little while. The only important bit that we want to find here is the internet address, or the INET as it's shortened to. And here it is, in the section called ETH0. ETH for Ethernet. This machine has an internet address, which is four numbers separated by dots. It's like a computer postcode. This one is 192.168.0.7. We have many IP addresses on the coach. 10 190 101 64, 10 190 101 143, 10 190 101 61, 10 190 101 62, 10 190 101 63, 10 190 101 65, one for each pi on each table. The important thing was that they were all different. Notice that none of the numbers between the dots are greater than 255. Note also that all of the addresses we used on the coach and in your school started with 10 190 101 and then a number. That's because 10 190 101 means your school. The last number is the machine connected inside the school. The last number can be anything from 1 to 254. That means you can have over 250 different machines working together in your school. So all we need to know at this stage is that 1. All addresses have to be different. 2. An internet address is four numbers separated by dots. And 3. To find your IP address, you only need to type ifconfig and look in the ETH0 section. That's it. How do you know you're connected to another machine? And how long does it take for your signal to get to that other machine? Warships will use sound to find submarines under the sea. The sound pings out and only returns if it's reflected by a submarine. Ping is the command used to get the Pi to send out an electronic ping to detect another machine. The command is sudo ping and then the IP address. This is what is seen if there's nothing there. Destination host unreachable. Here we are not connected to another address at 192.168.0.254. Let's try 192.168.0.1. Aha! There is something at that address and the time the ping takes is shown in this column. The first ping is normally slower as the remote machine has to wake up its sleeping process before it can respond. It's not unusual for pings to take slightly differing times as they all have to travel along the same network cables and have to share them with other machines. In the coach, the ping went between the pies in about a millisecond. Now, how long is a millisecond? It's a thousandth of a second. Is that fast? To stop the pinging scrolling up the screen, hold down the control key and press the C key. Having tried the pings between the pies in the coach, we then tried another ping. This time it was to my iLearn server in County Hall. The signal had to travel from your pie to the end of the coach, 
down the orange cable into the school into a box near your secretary's office. It then travelled by optical fibre down the road to County Hall in the bay. There it found the iLearn server in the computer centre, and that responded by returning the ping. How long did the ping take to get to and from the iLearn server in County Hall? Was this fast? In this section, we learnt to prove you have a connection to another machine. All you need to do is ping either the IP address of that machine, or if you don't know its IP address, you can ping the name. The ping tells you how long the signal takes to travel between the two machines. The time is measured in milliseconds, thousandth of seconds. Now that we know how to find an IP address using ifconfig and whether we're connected to another machine using ping, we can share a machine with a friend. To add a friend as a user on your Pi, you have to give them an account and permission to share. The command add a user reduces to add user, one word. So enter sudo add user and the friend's name like this. The Pi replies by asking for a password that you want to give your friend. Enter a good password for your friend. Remember, Pis don't print passwords on the screen, so take care. Type the password and press enter. The Pi replies with a request to enter the password again, just to make sure you typed it incorrectly. If both entries match, then the Pi completes the account by asking you a few simple questions that you can complete or ignore. Accept any default by just pressing enter each time. Eventually the question, is the information correct? Enter Y stroke N, so enter Y. Your Pi is now ready to be shared. Your friend now has to enter at their prompt on their machine, S login, their name, at your IP address. This causes their Pi to ask your Pi to share. The Pi needs to check the password. Once it's been confirmed, your friend is sharing your machine. You can see from the new prompt. To leave the machine, type exit and check that the prompt comes back to your machine. We learn to share our Pi here. First, you have to make an account using the add user command and then your friend securely logs in using slogin, their name, at your IP address. In the next section, we will see another way of sharing your Pi. You don't need a Pi to log into a Pi. You can log into a Pi using a Windows or Apple machine using an app called Putty. This is a good download link you can trust to download Putty, which is free. All you need to do is to add the address of the machine you want to log into here and check this SSH radio button if it's not already selected. Then press the open button at the bottom here. If all works well, this terminal window appears with the familiar content for you to enter your username and password to run the Pi as if you were sitting in front of it. So here you're running a Pi from inside another machine that's running Windows or iOS. Windows runs on Windows machines and iOS runs on Apple machines. The Pi is running a system called Linux and Linux has Tux, the penguin, as its mascot. Another name for Linux running on the Pi is Raspbian. Raspbian is what is known as a flavor of Linux. Other versions of Linux are Mint, CentOS, Puppy and Ubuntu. All of these versions are free to download and use. In fact, iOS and Android are related to Linux. Mobile phones, tablets, netbooks, laptops and PCs are all called platforms. When you connect it from one to another, it's called cross-platform, a cross-platform connection. Back in our console, we can type exit to close the connection and the window disappears. In this section, we saw a cross-platform connection. We saw how to use an app called Putty to log in to a Pi from an Apple or Windows machine. Here's a tip. After a while, you become fed up retyping lines of commands. Try pressing the up arrow key to reveal all of your previous commands. You can use the other arrow keys to edit the command and press enter. Use the backspace key to delete to the left or the delete key to delete to the right. 
you can press enter at any time. It's always good practice to log out cleanly rather than just pull the plug out of your Pi. You can lose or damage data by just unplugging machines, so don't do it. One way on the Pi is to just issue the shutdown command, but Linux can be very precise. You can add options using what are called flags. sudo shutdown minus h uses the halt flag. It means shutdown and halt. sudo shutdown minus r uses the r flag, meaning shutdown and then reboot. Now this may seem silly, but there are times when it's necessary to reboot, as we will see. But Linux can be even more precise. It wants to know when you want to shut down. You can specify any time, but to perform it immediately, the full command is sudo shutdown minus h now. This is the full shutdown command with all of the popular options. We won't do this now. Up until now, we've been typing commands at a prompt on a black background. This is known as text or command line mode, as commands are only entered line by line in text. There is another mode that's probably more familiar, as it's a standard on many devices. It's called the graphical user interface. Now this sounds grand, but like other computers speak, this is reduced to GUI, which is pronounced GUI. To start a GUI on the Pi, we simply type, or in lowercase, the word StartX. The Pi changes its character. Everything is now done via the GUI, using the mouse and keyboard, and even a touch-sensitive screen. It is a more modern interface, and possibly easier to use. From here, you can click the World logo to start a browser, and enter any web address here, or you can click this little black monitor screen to run a text screen inside the GUI screen. Have a play around. Click on this menu button to pull down all of the options, including another view of the shutdown command. Clicking on the shutdown option reveals the halt, reboot or exit to command line options. So, we have seen how to shut down cleanly from both text and GUI modes. Either way, do watch the red and green lights on the Pi and only unplug the power once the green light has stopped flashing. This will help keep your Pi working correctly. In this section, we learnt about shutting down cleanly. Shutting down cleanly tells Linux to close down all of the tasks in an orderly manner to ensure data is not lost. We have the options of a shutdown and halt, or shutdown and reboot. The Pi has closed correctly and halted when the green light stops flashing. The power can then be removed safely. We also saw the two modes of operation, the text command line mode and the graphical mode, or GUI. The text mode requires typing commands at the prompt. The GUI uses images with a mouse or touch screen. 